Welcome to the Rebel Rebel. I'm your host, Michael Dargy. The Rebel Rebel is a show dedicated to creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. It's a it's a love letter to those people who think audaciously and act courageously in service of making the world a better and more interesting place. And it's less familiar to a lot of people today because about 100 years ago, this training fell out of favor. When you decide and in your heart, you know what your purpose is, that the world conspires to help you achieve your, your passion and in your mission in this world. And when I found out that I could have it, like there was no way I was going to give it up again. I am so excited to introduce you to our next guest, Mandy Tice from the School of Atelier Arts based in New York. No spoilers, but we hit on everything from learning a new old way of seeing the world to Hogwarts to even naming a new color and everything in between. You're going to love it. Welcome to the Rebel Rebel. And across the planet, uh, where are you from? Well, let's find out. Is Mandy Tice from, uh, and I'm going to, maybe I'll pronounce this wrong, but we'll try the School of Atelier Arts. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. <laughs> Yay. Man Mandy, so I, I guess sort of catch us up. First of all, where are you in the world right now? Uh, so I'm currently in the New York City area, but I've certainly been bouncing around a lot with the work I do with the School of Atelier Arts. So. Nice. So look at us go, Atelier <laughs> Arts. So uh, if you could, why don't you, why don't you catch us up with what is the School of Atelier Arts and, you know, um, maybe give us the shape and flavor of it. And sure, then we'll go absolutely. Go back in time and find out how it came that way. <laughs> okay, so the School of Atelier Arts is an art school, and we teach people how to draw and paint realistically. So, if you ever wondered how Da Vinci like painted the Mona Lisa, he didn't just wake up one day painting the Mona Lisa. He trained in an atelier for ten years before he learned the skills he needed to paint the Mona Lisa. So, the oh. School of Atelier Arts, we teach people how to draw and paint realistically at really high levels. Okay. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> All right. So uh, I, I'm shocked to find out that Da Vinci just didn't wake up one day knowing how to do this. <laughs> None <laughs> of them did. Rembrandt, Da Vinci, Artemisia Dunlesky, you name the famous, you know, old master artist, they all trained in an atelier. <laughs> okay. So uh, tell me about what an atelier actually is. Like what, what is this? <laughs> sure. What is this? Is this a so yeah, it, it's a way of training, but if you think of it, it's kind of similar to a classical music conservatory. You know, it's a way of training that's existed for a very long time. It's kind of the collected body of art knowledge that's been handed down from artist to artist for from generation to generation. And it's less familiar to a lot of people today because about a hundred years ago, this training fell out of favor. And by the 1980s, there were only a couple places left in the world that we're still training students uh, with these skills, like these thousands, you know, hundreds and hundreds, some would argue thousands of years of artistic knowledge were nearly lost. And what? almost everybody who has the training today can uh, trace their training back to uh, the school either in Boston or in um, Florence, Italy. No kidding. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty crazy. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Like talk about a lineage to connect to. Um, For sure. Okay, so I, I guess the first question is, how did it almost get lost? Like, that seems weird. <laughs> well, um, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, one is that as, you know, abstract expressionism and modern art became more popular, um, realistic skills was considered passe, you know, by a portion of the high-end art populace. Um, part of the reason it uh, became less popular is because the artists that were running these ateliers literally died in World War I and World War II. <laughs> So that was a big problem. So the people with the knowledge and that were running the schools, um, you know, obviously the World Wars disrupted this training in a pretty significant way. And the majority of Americans during the late 1800s, early 1900s were training in Paris, which was considered uh, the place to go. Some went to Munich. So there was some of that, too. But that's why today, uh, even in the States, it's called atelier training, which is a French word that just means studio, because most okay. of the Americans that have the training got it from Paris uh, at the turn of the last century and then trained with somebody who trained with somebody who had been there. <laughs> wow. OK, wow. very cool. So way back in the day, if I jumped into my way back machine and <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I worked for a company called applied multimedia and we had a classical animation faculty. So we would, every Friday was our life drawing day. So we would sit down and yeah, smash down lines. So we would have, mm -hmm. um, models come in, mm -hmm. uh, clothed and unclothed robes and unrobed, like all mm -hmm. the different things, 
but we would do like, I think like 30 second gestures, 60 second gestures, one minute gestures, five minute, like it was crazy just getting the weight of the line down on the page. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, you're hitting on a really important point because when you asked me earlier, where did atelier training go? Uh, it fell out of favor, but the ones that were still doing it often went into the film and animation sector, oh, right? So a okay. lot of the artists that had the training went on there. But of course, you have different constraints working in animation than you do making like an easel picture. Sure. And so these uh, methods for developing how to draw quickly, and especially an emphasis on gesture became really popular, uh, you know, parts of the training that were kept and carried on. Wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Go Mickey Mouse, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, when they started doing uh, the computer animation, they were trying to go back and, you know, fix up some of their old, you know, hand drawn animations. And they didn't have anybody left that still had that skill set. And they had to bring back these retired people that were very, very, you know, in their 80s and 90s to help Whoa. them. Because even within, you know, Disney, some of those skills have been lost, you know, in the 90s. Oh, isn't that wild? So uh, like, and it would have been, when would it have been like late nineties, we were doing this. And, um, so we were doing cell animation. So light mm -hmm. table with paper, you know, flipping back and forth. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I think I want to say Glenn Keen was big then cause he, uh, designed Tarzan, which was sort of the new way of Walt Disney animating yes. stuff, which was pretty yes. cool. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, light and dark. Uh, is a is a big thing. So light and shadow would be oh a, for sure, a yeah. Huge piece of this. Well, you know, it's interesting because atelier training it's the collected body of knowledge, but certain parts of that knowledge become more popular at different points in time throughout history, uh, right? And okay. so you know, gesture is a really important part of training right now because animation is such a big part of our culture, right? Whereas at other points in history, maybe a different aspect was more valued of the training. So wow. Okay. Yeah. So I let, let me so let me just plug you into my way back machine. And, okay. Uh, let's travel you back buckle in up. time a little bit. Yeah. Buckle up. The right. DeLorean is going to hit 88. Excellent. And I'm curious what got you Mandy Tice into this. So uh, we're going way, way back because we're going back to Mandy's second grade field trip to the Dayton Art Institute in Ohio. What? <laughs> and yeah, way, way, way okay. back. And I was just a little kid and we went on this field trip and I saw real paintings for the first time in my life. Real realistic paintings, you know, from the 1700s, 1800s in this art museum. Yeah. And my heart just stopped in my chest and I was like, this is what I want to do. Like I've, I didn't know this was possible. But like I saw it for the first time and I just knew like this is what I want to do. And, you know, from that moment on, I worked so hard in my art classes. You know, I did everything I thought my art teachers would want me to do. But no matter what I did in my art classes, I wasn't getting closer to what I saw happening in those paintings in the museum because my art teachers didn't have atelier training. Like how could they teach me something that they didn't know? Right. Atelier training has fallen so far out of favor that even if you want to learn these skills, and I'm a licensed art teacher myself, you know, it, like I didn't have these when I was teaching in the classroom either, right? It wasn't until I found the atelier that I eventually learned those skills that I could teach to others. Oh. So, you know, by the time eighth grade rolls around, you know, I'm like, I guess I just don't have it. I don't have that magic hit it thing. I wasn't bopped on the head by a talent fairy. Poor me. I guess the best thing I can do if I want to contribute to art is I'll, I'll become a teacher and maybe one of my students will have it, you know, and that will be oh. how I contribute to the art world. So then I became obsessed with like learning pedagogy and like how to teach art. And I was really particularly interested in skills because that's of course what I felt like I had been missing. And so fast forward through college, I got my art education license. I'm teaching in a classroom and my students are asking me, there was one in particular, uh, I will never forget this. He was like, I want to make this guy look like he's flying through a cloud. And, you know, I gave him some tips about what I knew, like maybe put one cloud in front and one cloud behind. Yeah. And, you know, and he just, he, with the adjustments, he kept getting closer, but also more frustrated. And it was clear that I didn't have the skills to help him achieve the artwork that was in his head right? There was a disconnect. 
And I was so distraught and so upset with myself. And, you know, I started looking online, like how to make a guy flying realistically, how did you, <laughs> you know, doing everything I could to find this answer. And I stumbled upon atelier training. I had no idea that this training still existed. I had no idea that the people in those museums all those many years ago had atelier training. And it was like somebody telling me I could go to Hogwarts, wow. right? Like, you mean if I just go to this magic school and work really hard for four or five years and then I can learn this magical skill I had always dreamed of. And it was just a, a game changer for me, right? So wow. I left the teaching world and because, you know, atelier training was something you had to do full time, right? It's not something that you know, you could do a part-time situation. So, I mean, not like I had much money saved anyways. I was like a second, third year art teacher <laughs> in Montana, nonetheless, <laughs> like the lowest pay scale you can go. And I moved to Seattle to pursue training and I got my atelier training. And now I help people all over the world learn atelier training in ways that are a little bit more accessible. So for example, the School of Atelier Arts, we have something called um, the uh, Atelier Painting Boot Camp. And it's a class twice a week. People come together online and I teach them how to paint realistically. And uh, I also work with the Florence Academy of Art and we run an accredited master's degree program. The first fully accredited master's degree program for atelier training uh, in Florence, Italy. And then part of the program is in the New York City area as well. So, oh, you know, I just, <laughs> you know, I finally found it. And then my goal is like, I have to share this, right? Like, I know other people are out there like me. I know that they're looking oh. for this. And I know that they don't even know that it exists. And like, here it is, it's accessible. And anyone who wants to learn how to draw and paint realistically, there is no talent fairy you need to go to an atelier and you will learn there. It's impossible not to learn there. Wow. You can do it. Holy moly. <laughs> I, you know, I think, you know, you're, you're like a, you're a bit of a unicorn in a way. Like <laughs> you don't often meet people who, who got, you know, smoked in the brain with their, the thing they want to do in second grade and, and, <laughs> and it's stuck. So, yeah, I, I feel really lucky, but you know, it was one of those things that was both lucky and torturous because if I had said I wanted to be a classical pianist, there's all these schools and ways to be a classical pianist that were known. And I could have gotten this training from a very young right. age. Right. But nobody knew how to help me get what I wanted because this training was nearly extinct. Right. Uh -huh. So, um, so there was like the psychological pain of knowing what you wanted and feeling at the time, wrongfully so that. I just didn't get bopped on the head by a talent fairy. And this thing that my heart pined for wasn't possible for me. Right. Wow. It, it, behind you, there's, uh, and so this is going to drive people to go see the YouTube, obviously, <laughs> but <laughs> I, sure. I see some art. This is an art podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> right? You should check it out. Maybe. Uh, it, yeah. <laughs> is that one of your pieces behind you? What is that that I'm looking at? Yeah, actually, both of those are mine. Um, the drawing of the person is actually a study for a life-size self-portrait that uh, I painted. And then the drawing actually has a great story behind it because... Um, you know, as I started getting this training, my art teacher friends were like, hey, Mandy, how did you do that? And so I started teaching my art teacher friends and I started teaching at art teacher conferences. And then then non-art teachers started asking me, I want to know too, wow. right? Um, actually, a lot of dentists, a lot of dentists really want to know how to draw and paint realistically really? in my experience. Yeah. So if you're a dentist out there and you always dreamed of painting and drawing realistically, <laughs> here's your chance. Uh, but anyways, so I teach these classes and, um, you know, I was teaching an in-person workshop and my students were being like, this is hard. And it is, it is difficult to learn the skills. Anybody can learn them, but you have to show up and do the work. Yeah. Right. Um, and my one student was like, it's because I have the wrong pencil, Mandy. And I'm like, no, it's not because you have the wrong pencil. And they kept going on and on about it. like, yeah, but if only I had this brand of the pencil or like this, and I'm like, it's not the pencil. Like it's about training your eye to see better than you can see right now. And it actually doesn't matter what your utensil is. If your eye is trained really well, you could draw with a crayon. And she turned around and she was like, prove it. <laughs> Fair. So, so behind me is what's called a cast drawing. And so it's a plaster cast of um, a well-known sculpture called the Nubian Man. 
And it's a 3D model that's cast in white plaster. And the advantage of white is that it shows a lot of form, a lot of lights and darks, you know, so it's a really good teaching tool in the atelier. So I set up this cast and that was done entirely with crayon. What? Yeah. If you, um, if you go to Mandy Fine Artist on Instagram, I have details of this drawing so you can see it like super up close, but yeah, it's, it's a crayon, like the crayons that kids use. Right. And the, the point is that if your eye is trained well, you can achieve, you know, beautiful effects in your drawings. I have seen now this is, this is not that, but I have seen people actually do paintings with, um, like, uh, Q-tips on the, on, on dirty cars. Mm -hmm. They'll <laughs> yes, yes. It's the same concept, right? Like it, it doesn't really matter what the tool is or what the media is. What matters is how well your art, your eye is trained. Um, right now, you know, close to the holiday season, uh, I keep seeing these like little um, TikTok videos of people putting the spray snow down and then kind of oh, drawing yeah. with it and arranging it. Same thing, right? It doesn't matter what it is. If your eyes train well, you can create these amazing oh, effects. That's so cool. Well, and it's, it's such, that's, I'm so glad that you're saying this because um, I, I'm an artist, but I'm not trained in that I haven't, I, I always had a natural ability, but I never developed it because they're just, uh, I don't know. I just didn't push myself to it. It just, Sounds like you need it to does, be because I'm, I'm listening to that. I'm just like, <laughs> I know that there's, I have big holes in my game and, you know, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. there sometimes I can't, whatever's in my head will just come out, but I would love to be able mm-hmm. to, you know, transcribe what I see accurately from, you know, oh, life absolutely. to brain to paper. Yes. And, you know, it's useful for a lot of reasons. You know, some people are like, oh, well, if I don't want to be a painter, why should I learn this training? Like, I really believe that visual literacy is just as important as reading literacy and that everybody should learn to draw at at least a moderate level because it helps you not just see your drawing better or translate real life objects like you're talking about. It helps you actually use your eyes in a new way and take more in every day. Like, People who see more colors than you can teach you to see colors you have never what? seen before. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, that's one of the first lessons people get in my online class. You know, I actually have a free color class on schoolofatelierarts.com. If, you, if you're like, nah, I don't believe you, <laughs> I challenge you to take this free class at schoolofatelierarts.com. And uh, it, it's a color class. And if you don't see... Uh, like I, I bet you, I bet you a hundred dollars, Michael, that if you take this class, that you'll see a color that you didn't see before you, you are, took the class. It's on like Donkey Kong, Mandy. I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. I'm gonna do it, and and not for the hundred bucks, but I want to see this magical color. <laughs> what? Yes, yes. Well, you know, it's not like there's a yeah. new color. It's not like there's like schmarnge out there or like some new color. It's the nuance in between mm-hmm. colors. It's the nuance between intense colors and more neutralized colors. And, um, you know, just getting the subtlety of teaching your eye to, to see these smaller increments of change between colors. That's what really the training does. And, and those are the colors. Oh, that I see love it. Of. I'm so excited. Mm-hmm. All right. I- I mean, who doesn't want to see more colors? Like, who's got two thumbs and wants to see more colors? This guy. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's so true. And like, think of all the professions that would benefit from seeing more colors. Like think of the scientist looking at a Petri oh, sure. dish, right? Like maybe there's a slight change in color of what's growing there. Wouldn't you want right, to recognize maybe that? That's going to lead to the next big discovery. Schmorange. Sure. You know, yeah, schmorange. You have a good memory. <laughs> it's it's short. Schmorange is my new favorite <laughs> <I> color. <love> <laughs> uh, it's fun yeah. to say too. I encourage everybody yeah, to give it a right go. Now, it's delightful. Yeah. <laughs> but best thing I've invented. Oh, I love today. it. I love the fact that you just invent stuff and you've invented new colors. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, uh, I'm going to decide someday specifically what color schmorange is. It's going to be like a neutralized mm. yeah, orange we'll, of we'll some see. kind, I think. Schmarmy Oh, schmarmy. Oh, schmarmy like, yeah. It's got, a, it's got attitude. Yeah. Yeah, you're kind of like, oh, yeah. I don't know. I like it, but it's, oh. <laughs> it makes me feel off. It yeah. makes me feel yeah. weird. Yeah. Love, hate. <laughs> it's totally schmarmy. Oh, wow. Uh, so what's, uh, so oh. you've got this thing going on. And uh, we'll put all the links mm-hmm. in the show notes and stuff like that. Uh, what's sort of what's next for you? Or is it just like doing this? This is this is the thing. 
Um, you know, what I love doing most is teaching people how to draw and paint realistically. And so, you know, the online classes that I teach are like the best part of my day every day, you know. Um, and so I, I definitely look to, you know, continue doing that. And also um, the book offers are starting to pop up. So I think the next project is is probably going to be putting some of this knowledge into book form. Um, you know, I'm, I there's lots of how to draw books out there and things like that. But the book I really want to create is helping everyday people, people who are not artists, gain value from learning a little bit about art and how it can affect them in their day to day lives in a positive way, like a visual literacy for the everyday. Oh, kind of that person. is so cool. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad we met. <laughs> I, I, Oh, me too. I, I like adored you from the minute we first met. It's like this, this guy is on my wavelength. Oh, like, that's this is so good. cool. So, uh, wow. So book deals, you know, of course there's going to be like the, 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 the movie. <laughs> It'll be animated, of course. Uh, well, you know what I would really love, you know, I think about this all the time. Like why do people love Bob Ross so much? It wasn't like, oh no, art is something that's high above you that you don't get yeah. and you're dumb for not understanding. He was like, hey, anybody yeah. can learn this, right? And um, although I think that his technical level wasn't super high, you know, at least he believed that skills could be learned and that skills could be taught and that anybody could access them, which is very different from a lot of the mainstream art theory that's being bantered about on the super high end <laughs> art world right, level, right. you know? Um, yeah. Like, you know, think of how disconnected a lot of people are to art too. Like, you know, a lot of people, when I tell them that I'm an artist, the first thing they'll do is they'll throw up their hands and be like, oh, I don't get art. You know, like this, like, <sighs> ah, you know, not me. I don't get art. And it's like, it's okay. There's a lot of stuff that's purported to be art that is complete sure. BS. Right. <laughs> like, of yeah. course you don't get it. It's like the emperor has no totally. clothes. Right. Like, just because someone says this machine that drops blank pieces of paper from the ceiling is high, deep art and doesn't mean that it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> Fact. Yeah. So I, I hate art shaming. I, I believe that people should love the art that they love and hate the art that they hate. And, you know, we think of like movie stars, right? Like you can say, oh, I love this actor in this movie, but hated the acting in this movie. And that's perfectly acceptable, yeah. right? But if we criticize high-end art artists today then it's like oh you must not get art oh you must oh, be dumb yeah <laughs> right it, it's like it doesn't make uh, any sense well so. yeah i think sometimes it's used as a tool to you know to control people or to lord over other people in certain contexts right <laughs> for sure um well and that's why in so many ways like realistic drawing and painting is the countercultural art movement and it's really the most rebellious thing you can do <laughs> as an artist is to say skills matter because the high end art world for the last hundred years has been like beating it into us that skills are irrelevant. <laughs> they don't matter. Right. So ironically, it's the countercultural movement. Oh, that's in art. so wild. Uh, I, I don't know if you follow him and I don't know where he is in the world right now. And I would love one day to have him on the show, but Bill Watterson is one of my favorite artists of all time. Um, he's the creator of Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, yeah. okay. Thank you. I'm like, I yeah, feel yeah. like I know that name. It's like my brain's like field. swimming and fishing. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's wonderful. But, and like, what a delightful mix of artistry and thoughts and yeah. joy. All yeah. In one yeah. And it, yeah. The reason why I guess I was thinking of that is that, you know, obviously clearly very highly trained, but was able to mm -hmm. transcribe that training into this world view that he has. And I think that mm -hmm. if you have that yeah. training, and I don't know whether he had atelier training or if he just. Well, he certainly had some realism training. Like he, he is able to accurately express himself using the skills <laughs> yeah. and techniques of realism. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's not like an all or nothing, too. Like there's a lot of people that had a little bit of atelier training or had one instructor in school that might have uh... had access to some of it. Um, it's just that, you know, in order to create the drawings and paintings that you see in the museums, you know, that we if you're thinking of like old master mm -hmm. paintings, like it does require a, a lot of full-time study to, to achieve uh, that level I, with somebody who has the training. Cause a lot of people go to college thinking they're going to learn that. And like, I'm a college professor, yeah. right. And I just accredited what I, as far as I know, the very first, uh, fully atelier master's degree program. Um, and I can tell you that there aren't 
others out there that I know of that are full atelier wow. programs, right? Um, there's a lot of people that are starting to use that word because it's becoming sure. more popular, but definitely check to make sure that they actually have the skills that you're trying to achieve because so many students go off to college and they're like, I'm going to learn how to draw and paint realistically. And no, you're not. You can only do it if your teachers have that skill set. And most of the colleges do not have teachers with that. Skill what is set. the, and I don't know if this is fair to ask or if there is an answer even, but is there like, is there a progression? Is there something that you would look for to be like, okay, I need to get this first and then this and this and this. Um, so different ateliers teach the training in different ways. Um, the atelier that I trained in, uh, and this is common with many ateliers, is drawing only for the first oh. year. Uh, you don't even touch color. <laughs> um, then the next year, my training was called en grosaille, which uh, just means painting in black and white. So oh, wow. um, you're trying to learn how to handle the paint at the same level that you can handle your charcoal or your pencil. Wow. Right. Um, and then you do a limited palette um, or a warm, cool palette. And then in your fourth year is when you go into full color painting. That's a common progression for wow. ateliers. Um, now, I actually teach a little bit differently because I am, you know, I, I come from an education background and I found that students were coming to me and they're like, I want to paint, I want to paint, I want to paint. I don't want to draw for a year. I want to paint. I want to paint. <laughs> And it was like pulling teeth to get them right. to draw, right? Because they had it in their head that they wanted yeah. to learn how to paint. So I actually start my students off with full color painting. We do master copies in the online atelier painting boot camp, And the master copies, because you can copy the drawing of the master, you don't have to worry about your drawing skills oh. quite yet, but you can start learning some of the painting skills. And they get good enough doing these master copies that they start to realize that if they really want to improve their painting, their next step is to oh, draw. Okay. Right. And then they willingly and lovingly go into yeah. drawing and get that skill set. It's like, you know, here, have some have some paint, go tell your friends, you know, like yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, right. yeah. But it, it hits like that mark, you know, because when you do a master copy, it, you can, especially when you do it at a high level, the way we teach it in our online classes, like you get a huge sense of accomplishment and you learn so much. And the most important thing that you learn is what you don't quite oh, know that. yet. Right. And so um, it, it makes it much, you know, just pedagogically, it helps me help the students actually learn drawing better right. when I start with the painting because they're open minded about it and they see how it can help them with painting because otherwise people are just like, no, no, I don't want to do drawing. I want to paint as if they're different things. Like painting right. is drawing. Oh, so uh, is it oil or is it acrylic? Um, I teach exclusively in oil. Um, sometimes I have students that really prefer acrylic for one reason or another. Um, there's a lot of bad information about acrylic paint mm. and oil paint. The oil paint has a bad reputation as being somehow more dangerous or more toxic. Or than difficult, acrylic paint. I thought. But um. You know, it has that reputation, but in my opinion, acrylic paint's a million times more difficult. Uh, it dries so quickly that you can't like fix your uh, mistakes. Um, you can't mix up color strings at a time without them drying out. Um, they do have extenders that you can add, but even those mm. get mucky. And, um, you know, like oil paint and acrylic paint, they have the same pigments in them if you're using high quality paints, right? So if you have a cadmium red, it's the same pigment, whether it's acrylic or right. oil paint. What's different is the binder. So oil paint is those particles are bound together with oil, like yeah. vegetable oil. Um, and with acrylic, it's actually plastics. Oh. So um, plastics have all sorts of stuff in it that we're still just beginning to understand, right? So I, I don't understand how oil paint got the bad oh. reputation uh, when it's the binder's vegetable oil versus plastics. But there you go. There you have it. Uh, big, big plastic. <laughs> Well, here's a fun like rebel story okay. for you about the invention of acrylic paint. So there was this guy, Van Meegren, who during World War II made um, fake uh, paintings and uh, what do you call them? Like yeah. imposter paintings? Why can't you uh, think of the word? Uh, yeah. The, the, like, uh, uh, <laughs> oh my God. Cut, forgeries. 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 <laughs> yes. Okay. So he made forgeries of this artist yeah. Vermeer. Okay. And, but at the time, the way they would test for forgeries is if it was done with oil paint and you put a little bit of solvent on a Q-tip, if the painting was less than a hundred years old, some of that pigment would come uh. up. Right. Um, and so Van Meegren was trying to figure out this way, like, how can I make the paint hard? And so plastics had just come out 
And he basically invented acrylic paints to paint these forgeries. And then he would trade his forged paintings because the Nazis were obsessed with Vermeer. And he would trade like one forged Vermeer for like 20 authentic old master paintings that the Nazis had. And it was kind of like his way of like, wow. (laughs) Okay, that's cool. (laughs) Yeah. So don't tell me that artists don't like, aren't politically savvy, you know? That's a deep cut. (laughs) Holy crap! Yeah, there's a great book about it. Um, I wish I could remember the title off the top of my name, uh, top of my head. But if you look up um, Vermeer forgeries, uh, you'll, the book will pop up. It's a great. Oh, I story. will put a link in the show notes. We we will find it. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> so uh, okay, you're uh, you're in New York. Here's here's yeah. Ish. So, so yes, I can't claim yeah, like we, proper New York City, to, but yeah, ish. we don't need to narrow you down to a specific <laughs> geographic location. But let's just say <laughs> that you're walking in new mm-hmm. york ish here's mandy mm-hmm. it's a lovely mm-hmm. early winter day and you're mm-hmm. you, maybe you've got a dog with you you have a dog mm-hmm. with you i would love yeah. to have a dog sometimes i pretend i have oh, a great dane nice. but i actually don't i have a friend that has a great dane <laughs> named monty um that's a great name for <laughs> totally. a great dane. <laughs> okay so you're 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 walking to <laughs> new york ish you've got your your dog which is a great dane with you whatever and you're thinking to yourself, right. Andy, I wish the world knew this. And it, what is the one thing? And it, may, it could be the atelier training, but what is the one thing that you mm-hmm. wish the world knew? I wish the world knew how powerful our eyes were and the capacity they have for seeing. All right. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And I... I I think I take them for granted. <laughs> yeah. And I like the average person like is using just such a small percentage of their eyes ability. And, you know, to me, it's equivalent. Remember like a hundred years ago, people were like, I don't need to read. And nobody was really that literate. And my grandpappy didn't read and I don't need to read. But to me, the visual illiteracy of today is of that level. And the amount of knowledge and information that people can achieve by learning how to read, or in this case, learning how to be visually yeah. literate, uh, is equal. Like, that's how much information people are missing out on. Um, you know, drawing used to be part of prestigious school training. You know, it, it was really important. It was considerably, really, it was so important they used to teach it in finishing school to women, right? Who weren't supposed to, uh, you know, they were only given the essentials oh of what they really needed to know like how to read and how to draw right um so it it has been a really important part of our culture for a really long time until about 100 years ago and then off it off with its head it just disappeared and it's like the world became illiterate and it kills me well but you're bringing it back you yeah that's the plan yeah beating on Um, his chest live damn it live Yes. Well, like that's the thing is I try so hard to make it accessible because it can be intimidating for people to look at the drawings and paintings behind me um, or look at atelier trained, uh, you know, artists and be like, oh, I can't do that already. I must not be able to do that. Right. And I think what makes what I'm doing different from what some of the other ateliers are doing in this space is trying to bridge that accessibility gap. Like I have students from all sorts of backgrounds in my classes, right? Like, you know, I mentioned the dentists, like a lot of dentists and doctors that always wanted to be artists and ended up in med school. (laughs) And then, um, you know, from all walks of life, a a postal worker, uh, you know, it's, you know, anybody can do this. It's a skill like reading that can be learned, right? It's just a matter of have you had access to the information? And even if you've had art classes, most likely you've not had access to this information. So, uh, you know, it's out there for you. And if you want it, like you can have it. Like that's why, you know, most ateliers do like full-time study only or whatever, but that's why I started this like two day a week class because I really wanted to help people bridge that gap um, to visual literacy. Sorry, I keep getting the mic. (laughs) (laughs) Your your audience Uh, is going to be like, ah. (laughs) Oh, okay. So uh, that's amazing. I, okay. So you've inspired me. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, Are you going to start so. your training? I think, I think, I think, I I think you should. Uh, because as you're mm-hmm. talking, you know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about What's the that? smell of a box of crayons. <laughs> oh, isn't that right. the best? Or Oh, I love it. I was hanging out with my niece and she opened up a box of crayons. I'm like, oh, right. 
<laughs> my yeah. heart. <laughs> and I, then I, that that instantly led to, uh, and I don't know if you have these, but I want to say they're called Prisma, uh, the uh, uh, pen, pencil crayon. Oh yeah, the yeah color pencils. pencils. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my dad mm-hmm. used to have those for geology, so he, he used to coloring mm-hmm. maps and stuff like that. But I remember like the yeah, yeah. the sound of sharpening a pencil crayon and the smell <laughs> that it would come, and then oh, mm-hmm. mm. yeah, it's the best. It's the best. You can't, and I still do some digital illustration and stuff, but it's, not like, the same. it's just not the same. Like, you know, even like the paper resisting the crayon as you like yeah. put it down is such a joyful yeah. feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that yeah. they have like, you can put paper like on your iPad and stuff like that. I, I do have that and you can get mm-hmm. nibs on your pens and stuff like that, but it's not quite mm-hmm. the same. It's yeah. never the same. Yeah. Not quite. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Not quite. Well, yeah. Someday. Well, Yeah. <laughs> Or not. Or, you know, maybe we're in the rejection like phase, like the arts and crafts movement was kind of like pushing back against the mass production in the last century. Maybe atelier drawing is the arts and crafts movement of oh, this generation. Yeah, I love it. Well, there's something very nice about the tactile, about the sensory side of it, too. Right. Like you, we talk about, you know, oh. you you've talked about, you know, training your eyes to see better but then there's all the other ancillary things that come along with it like the, the smells and the feelings and you know, it's kind oh, of an all encompassing sure, sure. thing. So I think that's really cool. I think what you do is awesome. Mm-hmm. Me thank too. you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for being awesome enough to have a podcast where I can share uh, this passion with others because that's not my skill <laughs> well, it's, set. It's really, uh, I think it's, I think it's amazing. People are going to get a lot out of this and I hope they jump in and like try the school of atelier arts.com. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> uh, yeah, dot com. Yes. Uh, yeah, even if you just want to, even if you think I'm full of crap and you think that you can't actually see more colors, try out our free color class. Um, you know I what? I'm going to do that this week and I'll get, I will, I will report back. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Please do. Amazing. Please do. I would so, love that. So uh, here's a, here's a part of the show that I, I really love. There's, there's, I love all of this actually. There's no one part, but <laughs> um, I would like to know. If you had any, so there's, maybe it's artists, but maybe, and I know that you know, you've talked a lot about it, you know, learning how to see differently. And I realize that that's, that's a thing, but I, I wanted you to maybe go zig a little instead of zagging. And, you know, what advice <laughs> would you have to others, either artists or teachers or, um, you know, entrepreneurs, creative rebels, what advice do you have for them to get to their next level, whatever that happens to be? Um, that's, that's really good. Um, I think, I think that you just, and this is such lame advice, but you just have to do it. And, you know, there was a piece of my story that I didn't tell earlier that Perfect. I think I should tell now, which is when I left teaching, it was the 2008 financial crisis where the entire art department at the school I was oh teaching at got cut. Um, and that was like my moment of, that was my chance. That was my chance. I had just learned about atelier training and here was an unemployment check and it was my chance. And I really believe that when you decide and in your heart, you know what your purpose is, that there's that the world will conspire. Who is it? Paulo Coelho would say that the world conspires to help you achieve your, your passion and in, in your mission in this world. And if you know what it is, then you can take advantage of the opportunities when they wow. pop up. Holy shit, Andy, that's awesome. <laughs> what a cool story and how brave. Uh, yeah. It was terrifying. <laughs> but also, like, it was like being told, like, think of whatever your childhood dream was. Like, if you always want to be an astronaut and then all of a sudden you're like 26, 27, and someone says, okay, NASA called, it's your chance. Are you coming? <laughs> uh- <laughs> right, that's, that's what atelier training was to me. There was no way I was going to miss that wow. dream again. Right. I thought I'd given it up once thinking that I just didn't have it or, you know, and when I found out that I could have it, like there was no way I was going to wow. give it up again. Outstanding. Thank you for sharing that. That's inspiring as I'll get out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start looking for my opportunities <laughs> that I'm um, missing. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's people are so cool and I think people don't recognize like how good they are at certain things, you know? Um, like, uh, I know somebody that's amazing at like finding the root cause of a problem. Right. And 
you know, I'm like, you, you should do something with this. You need to write a book about like you, you have like this whole system in place. You've got <laughs> so much about this and you're so good at it. Like, how are you holding this back from the world wow. and humanity? <laughs> like, you, you know, and a lot of people think, oh, well, it's a silly little thing. Well, it's silly to you because you're an expert in it and you don't even realize it. And I think everybody has that. I think everybody has that, um, that they don't always know what it is. All right, people yeah. look deep. Ask a friend. What, actually, <laughs> go ask somebody that's just like, hey, what am I good at? Or what, like, what's the thing that you think when Absolutely. you see me, what do you think of? You know, um, that's really mm-hmm. cool advice. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And then the share secondary it with the world. Advice, like, yeah. it's not just having it. Yeah. Figure out, figure out your, what, what your thing is and then share it. What mm-hmm. is your, what is your guilty pleasure? What's the thing that you do Ooh. just for Mandy? like bath marathons like you ever take a five hour bath <laughs> yeah 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 see i don't have a bathtub so whenever i travel i always try to book a place with a bathtub and oh. then like if i'm not at whatever my appointment is that i'm traveling for in the bathtub <laughs> God, I love it's like that. my best thinking spot like, yeah i love it yeah. yeah oh that's amazing okay i love yeah. that uh, are you an Epsom salts person or a bubble bath? No, I'm a purist. Just... I don't, I don't even like the jets. Like I'm, what? I'm like a water. Pu- yeah, no, like huh. I, I don't need that distraction. It's my thinking time. You know, like, I just want to like float away in my mind and spirit. And then oh, think, that's think about my next painting or think about, you know, the next class I'm going to teach or. Oh, that's very cool. What's your favorite yeah. place in the world? People always laugh at me when I say this. Albuquerque. I freaking love Albuquerque. Are you like Bugs Bunny? Like what's going on? <laughs> Albuquerque. Um, so it's like the food is so good and it's so cheap and there's like these lavender farms that you can just like wander through and they smell magical and amazing and they burn like pinion pine there which is unlike other wood that like it's a unique smell that's unlike anything else and the best absolute best thing about albuquerque is that you can order any food you want there christmas style what (laughs) yeah you heard me christmas style which means that so there's red salsa and green salsa and christmas style is when you have both the salsas (laughs) Stop it. You don't even have to pick one kind of salsa there. <laughs> it is my favorite place. I love Albuquerque. I like oh, adore it. My God. Okay. That's, <laughs> that is a first. Uh, okay, Albuquerque. You're, yeah. Get yeah. ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to get flooded with, yeah. with listeners. <laughs> That's right. Tens yeah. of listeners will come to, <laughs> 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 to Albuquerque. Oh, I love it. That, that's amazing. Mandy, this yeah. has been so much fun. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I've been your host, Michael Dargy, and this has been the Rebel Rebel Podcast. It's a podcast for creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. And hey, if you're a rebel or you know a rebel, why don't you head on over to the Rebel Rebel Podcast.com and fill out our guest request form. We'll get back to you within 24 hours and maybe we can share your story with the world. Don't forget to like, share or subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And thanks so much for listening. Until next time.